Thank you. Hi, everyone. Well, I think the first thing we need to say is uh, that we hope that uh, everyone in the path of this hurricane is healthy and well, and we wish the best to everyone that's in Florida, but also the people who are in Bahamas. It sounds like it was a terrible hit. So we hope that we're, they're in our prayers, and we hope that they're all well. And I know that some of you came especially to see Nan Yao Su, so I apologize. Hopefully, I, I won't disappoint you too much. I will not be talking today at all about uh, pest control, because that's urban entomology, because that's not what I do. I don't want to kill termites. I actually want to make new termites. So uh, I'm completely opposite to what Nan Yao Su's <laughs> lab would be doing. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to um, call your attention to this special um, issue that has been created for all of us. I'm uh, one of the editors in chief of Ecological Entomology. And uh, in combination with the Royal Entomological Society and Wiley, uh, we created for you and for this uh, meeting uh, a special issue uh, on termites. And so if you go to this um, link here and you press on that link, and we have this link posted all over the place, so if you don't take it now, make sure you look at it later. But please do, uh, we invite you to go this um, issue, and you can download, there's, I don't want to say hundreds, but there's definitely dozens and dozens of papers, all related to different aspects of termite biology. So we strongly urge you to go there because there must be something there that interests you. You can download the PDFs for free. The virtual issue will be there probably three weeks. It's not open-ended, unfortunately. So it's, it was done for you and for this meeting. And so we want to make sure that all of you use it. But after the time, three weeks more or less, it's going to be cut off. So please do and access this link sooner rather than later so that you can take advantage of, of, the, of the virtual issue. And there's really, s all of them are great termite papers, but, um, but uh, you, you should really look into them, okay? All right, so um, let's get started then. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about transgenerational immune priming in termites. Uh, before I even go there, we really should be all thanking our hosts uh, for having put all this time and effort uh, in organizing this uh, great meeting. And so I love coming to Brazil, and I'm excited to be here, and uh, we really uh, appreciate all your work. So uh, with respect to transgenerational immune priming, uh, first I want to start with saying thank you and actually acknowledging our, you know, my co-authors here. You all know by now Erin. Uh, she's my graduate student, and uh, she is working on her PhD. She's about to graduate, uh, hopefully November, she's defending. So yesterday she presented one of her chapters, and today I'm presenting another one of her chapters. So when I say we or I, it's really not we, it's all her. And so she did all of this, and I'm just here standing looking really cool and very knowledgeable about something I did not really do much about. But uh, so when I say we really, uh, we work together, but she is the person that you should go really and talk to her about this transgenerational immunity, which is really co cool idea. So here you have her uh, with one of our undergraduate students breaking up um, a long log. And we try to avoid these very long logs just because there might be s several colonies uh, in that big piece of, of wood. So we usually try to get the smaller pieces where we know we have an entire colony contained in those species, in those uh, logs. So, but this is unusual, but we spend a lot of time in California, in the western uh, part, in the uh, Oakland area, United States, and we spend 10 days every year there collecting animals like these, and then we take them to the lab. But that's the natural habitat of the species we work with. Uh, and that's what it looks like when you open and crack a big log. Is, is the lighting good? Can you see well? Yes? Okay. And everyone can listen. Okay, okay, because I have no microphone. <coughs> so you can see that there's lots of um, termites walking around. Most of these things are nymphs. 
uh, so that uh, when they produce alates, they produce a lot of alates all at once. Uh, so Erin gave yesterday uh, this, this talk, and I just want to step back for a moment, pick up from where she left, so that I can use it as a stepping stone to my uh, presentation, because again, this is her chapter, and basically the work that she presented yesterday and the work that I'm presenting today is really coming from the same experimental design. And so I need to step back, remind you what she said yesterday, and then move for forward. So the main story yesterday, uh, and please tell me if I'm correct or not, but the main story yesterday is that we could exploit the ontogeny of a termite colony uh, by looking at all its different stages of complexity in sociality and by us understanding what are the ecological pressures that today's colonies are facing, perhaps by doing this and exploiting this system here, we can say something about the forces and the selection pressures that happened millions of years ago um, in trying to understand the trajectory and the transitions that happened from solitary pre-ancestor termite uh, ancestor to a subsocial stage and then a, what's called a facultative stage of new sociality and ultimately the obligate. Here in obligate, here you have already sterile castes, whereas here the offspring stay at home, help mother and father, the king and the queen to produce more offspring, but they here retain the ability to reproduce themselves. And so the idea is that there's a whole uh, group of uh, ecological factors, including pathogens, but not only pathogens, you have desiccation, you have to kind of look like that, <laughs> predation, uh, the, uh, and, uh, and finding a, a, a wood. Uh, the, the wood is um, distributed randomly and it's also uh, uh, dispersed, uh, dispersed around in not necessarily evenly distributed. So finding a piece of wood that's gonna keep you uh, growing yourself and the entire colony uh, is a difficult thing to do. So the point is that these ecological pressures are reinforcing monogamy. Remember yeah, the benefits of monogamy. Yesterday she showed you that you have a male and that the male is really important. And nobody that gives, you know, social hymenoptera, people don't really think about males because males just mate and they're done. Here we have a system that allows us to really understand the male's perspective. And we shouldn't, you know, in the day of females and women, we should also remember that the males are important, so. All right, so all of these um, factors here are likely influencing both the evolution of monogamy and also by parental care. And Boomsma, uh, in his recent work, has spent a lot of time trying to explain that monogamy is one of those ancestral um, uh, uh, phenomena or mating strategies that likely serve as a stepping stone for the evolution of sociality. Right, so that's the main idea of what she explained yesterday, and I'm gonna take this and then move on uh, forward. In addition, we're working with uh, Grant Thompson. You can see him here in the circle. Um, we took these photos, uh, we had a great time in um, um, uh, the IUSSI meeting in uh, Kearns um, a few years back in Australia. And so instead of going to whatever, we ended up going termite hunting and these mounds are huge, okay? They're really, really large. There's this mountain here in the back. And uh, Graham Thompson was working with his student, Jessica, and the two of them hel helped us with uh, molecular techniques, with the transcriptomics that I'm gonna show you. So between us setting up this, the, the stage in our labs and then sending them samples, and they did the transcriptomic for us, okay? So it's important to keep them in mind as well. So this is a queen, so Termopsis angusticolis, again, the dampwood termite, Pacific dampwood termite from the United States. Uh, as you can see, she's really plump and ready and filled with uh, uh, reproductive activity there. And um, all the research that we're doing really falls within this umbrella of uh, ecological <coughs> immunology. Basically, the idea that you can study the relative investment that individuals do on their own immunity. And so that's how much energy are you gonna spend, depending on your environment, how much energy you're gonna spend in dealing with uh, pathogens. Not only do you 
spend energy in your own immune system, but in many instances, and I don't know if you can see this, it says here transgenerational immunity. How much investment you do, not on you, but on your offspring, okay? Are you protecting your offspring as well? And so these two concepts of ecological immunology and transgenerational immunity really are, um, have a lot of other interesting concepts related to them. So you have maternal and paternal effects. You have uh, phenotypic plasticity here all the way in the corner. I'm sure you can't read that because it's in yellow. Life history theory comes into play. Parental investment theory comes into play. Trade-offs, epigenetics, methylation, acetylation, all this stuff comes together to try to make um, an interesting and holistic uh, understanding of what's happening physiologically to these termites. And so because we're working with all of these concepts at once, it becomes a really interesting uh, project to work with. Uh, at least I think that Erin picked up a very good project to work for her PhD. So again, I'm gonna be talking about transgenerational immunity. And the whole idea here of transgenerational immunity is that parents, in this case mom, uh, allocates, we all know that, that parents allocate resources to their progeny, and then those contributions um, uh, increase the probability of the offspring making it and surviving so that they can themselves reproduce in the future. And so these presents here are uh, very important and these contributions appear to be uh, given context dependent, okay? So they're not always the same uh, uh, provisionings or contributions, those contributions change depending on the ecological pressures surrounding the mother, the father, and the offspring. So stressors such as photoperiod or predators, the presence of predators, uh, low resource availability, or temperature stress may influence how much you're contributing to the next generation here. In this case, in our lab, we're interested in disease and pathogens, so clearly pathogens are also a stressor that it plays an important role in influencing the contributions that parents are gonna make to their uh, progeny. Now I am not, uh, the idea here is that, you know, if mothers uh, here are living in a microbially rich environment, and our termites are living in a microbially rich environment, if mothers um, or parents can be exposed to a pathogen, and if, they could anticipate the immunological needs of their progeny based on their own immune status, then what they should do, or what you would expect them to do, is that they should tailor those contributions to their progeny and give them goodies, we call them goodies because we don't know what else to call them, contributions, goodies, that then this offspring could render this offspring less susceptible to disease. Okay, that's the idea. Is parents are shoving in something into those eggs uh, that is protective against pathogens and therefore those babies will do better in a microbially rich environment. Now I am not suggesting that um, these contributions are uh, encoded in the DNA. So there's no encoding here on the DNA. M I think that if we're on the right track, uh, parents may be doing transgenerational immune priming by providing the offspring with prefabricated uh, antimicrobial peptides, so the parents produce the peptides, antimicrobial, and then they shove them into the egg, or they may be giving immune elicitors, again, lipopolysaccharides or peptidoglycans that they latch onto when their own immune system is activated, and then they carry that into the baby or the embryo so that the embryo's genetic makeup then starts um, building its own immune um, responses. Uh, perhaps some immune-related factors here as well. Uh, the al alternative, or at least could be these and these, we're not sure, um, the idea is that some of these contributions may be actually epigenetic. So mothers or fathers may be influencing methylation rates in the DNA of the offspring so as to uh, vary the gene expression of, of uh, the offspring. Um, it could also be uh, based on this uh, histone acetylation. So these epigenetic markers could actually be influencing um, uh, uh, differential gene expression in the offspring and therefore the offspring would be doing better. So that's the whole idea of transgenerational immunity. Now the question to you is this should not be surprising because even mammals have this, okay? 
the, all of you benefited from transgenerational immunity. Everyone remembers why? You don't remember because you were very small. But through breast uh, milk, you basically got a lot of goodies, immune goodies from your mothers um, into you. Okay, so breast uh, and, and lactation in mammals is extremely important uh, as a form of passing on immune protection to the baby. Um, you have, oh, sorry, you have, I did the wrong one. Uh, you have breast milk here that's loaded with different types of uh, immunoglobins, antibodies, cells uh, that are important in immunity, as well as these things called oligosaccharides. And these oligosaccharides basically latch onto viruses or bacteria, make a complex, and then the baby is able to get rid of the complex without actually getting sick. So breast uh, uh, feeding and, and milk um, is very important way of doing this. So in insects, we know that transgenerational immunity is also happening. Um, there's evidence that transgenerational immunity is actually more widespread than we ever thought. Birds have, uh, have examples of that, uh, fish have examples of that, and uh, clearly insects uh, are also um, uh, exhibiting this phenomenon of transgenerational immune priming. So there's a few studies showing, so I'm showing you here mealworms, so the mealworms have two or, two different, two or three different species have been shown. Lots of different Lepidoptera have been shown to have uh, some aspects of transgenerational immunity. Fruit flies, there's no real consensus. I think there's two papers on fruit flies. You would think that by now we would really have something on fruit flies. And one paper says yes, and another paper says there's no, so we don't really know what's going on. Within the social insects, there's been attempts to try to figure out if there's also um, transgenerational immunity. There's studies on bees showing that there is. Uh, bumblebees here uh, seem to have this well and some ants. And the question is, what about termites? Where are termites here? And is it possible that termites are also benefiting from this uh, phenomenon of transgenerational immunity? Now, theoretically, I'm giving you a little bit of too much um, background, but it's important to understand why termites should have transgenerational immunity. And the reason is uh, you would expect TGI uh, uh, priming uh, to evolve in species that have certain characteristics. So they should clearly live in a pathogen loaded uh, environment, otherwise why should you be contributing immunity to your progeny? Uh, so there should be pathogens around. Uh, you should be not very dispersing. You should stay around in the area uh, because that will then allow you to be exposed to the same pathogens over and over and over, right? So if you have low dispersal, there's a higher probability that you'll be re-encountering those pathogens again and again and again. They're kind of predictable pathogens. And um, if you have extended overlap of parent offspring generations, then by you encountering as a parent every time, every cycle, every month, every time that it rains the same pathogen, it gives a cue that it's a consistent cue saying maybe you should protect your babies against this particular pathogen because it keeps on recurring over and over and over. And termites have all of these um, uh, factors. They fulfill all of these requirements. So termites are um, excellent candidates to look for TGIP, particularly uh, during the incipient stages of colony foundation. And the reason for that is that when you're just starting with a king and a queen and nothing else except wood, then that's when parents should really be asked to do these decisions. Shall I put a lot? Shall I put immunity? Shall I put something else into these contributions to my offspring? There's no workers that take away the, the, the pressures, and so parents by themselves need to make these decisions. So um, that is why Erin um, decided to do all of her research, or most of her research, by using these incipient stages of colony foundation. Okay, so her hypothesis was, and we're only gonna focus today mostly on maternal, although because I added a little bit extra, uh, at the end I'm gonna show you some paternal stuff that we're just getting started. Uh, so for the moment, I'm gonna just talk about maternal effects and maternal possible transgenerational immune priming. Uh, the idea is that mothers exposed to pathogens will um, produce phenotypically variable progeny, right? Some mothers, if they were exposed to a pathogen, may give more goodies or less goodies than other individuals that were not exposed to the pathogen. And that perhaps if TGIP exists, 
then we should have more immunocompetent progeny if the parents were exposed to a pathogen. So how did we do that? Well, we took the alates of Sotromopsis and Gusticolis, we collected them from those uh, colonies in the field, uh, we brought them to the lab, we waited for them to give us this, these alates, we sexed them, we dewing them, we weighed them, and we waited until they were really dark like this, uh, because that shows us that they're uh, ready to mate, and we know that they're ready to mate because they tell us they're ready to mate. <laughs> I'm gonna go back just so that you see that. How cool is that? I said like, oh, it's telling me it's ready. So there, ready to mate. And then what we did is, since we're gonna be talking only about maternal effects, uh, the only ones in the pair that were actually treated were the females, okay? So the males were always naive. We did nothing with the males for now, but I'm gonna show you some evidence later that we also did, we, to be honest, we did maternal effects, paternal effects, and combined effects, okay? Today I'm only doing maternal. Um, so those are chapters for her thesis. Uh, and so what we did is, again, the males here are naive, nothing was done to them. The females were either naive, again, nothing was done to them, or we injected them with a saline injection, just pure sterile saline, in order to control for, uh, to, to make, to understand the effect that just puncturing the cuticle may have. Because there's evidence that shows that even if you puncture the cuticle, that in itself already initiates the immune system, okay? Breaking the cuticle seems to already elicit some kind of immune response. We also uh, injected the termites with, and again, the light is not great here, but uh, serratia marcescens. You saw this yesterday. This is a very pink bacterium, soil bacterium, naturally occurring in the ground, and we know that these termites are naturally infected with this, this pathogen. All right, so we injected them here. You can see how we went in. And uh, once this, the, ah, and also we injected them with um, two versions of this serratia. The first one was here what we call heat killed, which is really just a vaccine, okay? We boil this bacteria and we're providing the termite with uh, pieces that do not really make the animal sick, but it induces an immune response, a vaccine. And then we also have live bacteria here. And this was a sub-lethal dose because we didn't wanna kill everyone, we just wanted to give them a good uh, immune challenge without killing them so that we could see the cascading effects in the progeny. Uh, and after doing that, we put them together in a petri dish like that. This is a, an incipient colony. We call them our baby colonies. And you can see here the male, you can see here the female, and all that wood. And they get really romantic, and they start giving us eggs, and then those eggs hatch, and then they give us the babies that you saw yesterday in her uh, video. So we put them together, she gives us eggs. We, first we follow the parental survival, right? We treated the parents, we wanna know that whatever we did to the parents is having an effect on the parents. So we treated the parents and we followed the survival for 30 days and I'm gonna show you that data. But then we waited for those eggs and we stole the eggs. That's why yesterday I was asking you if you stealing the eggs made a difference in the volume. And I was very happy to hear that volume did not change because that's exactly what we found too. So, uh, so we got those embryos and we took several fitness related parameters uh, for purposes of today, discussion and time. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about volume, protein content, antimicrobial activity in the transcriptomics. Again, Erin talked a little bit yesterday about hatching success and onset of oviposition and so on, so I'm not gonna be talking about that as well. Let's see the parental, uh, um, the, the female's uh, survival. So this is called survival distributions. You know what they are already. On the y-axis, percent survival. On the x-axis here, you have days post-establishment and post-treatment because we treated the queens on the same day we paired them with the males. And what you can see here, this is nice distributions that are breaking down uh, lovely as a function of their treatment. So green is naive. This is normal mortality. Nothing, you know, in 30 days, you already lose, I don't know, uh, between almost 15% of the colonies. Blue saline, yellow here is heat killed, and the lowest uh, survival was for those that were exposed to the live bacteria. Makes total sense, okay? But it's important to show this because here is the time when we see first of position. Between day 10 and 20, these colonies are gonna start giving us those eggs. And so given that you have this mortality, this bad mortality for the exposed termites here, 
we are confident, we feel confident that on this time here, we were asking the female to make physiological decisions. She was going in there thinking, okay, what do I do, okay? And the questions that she probably had to think about, of course, I'm not serious about this, um, we were forcing the female to make the following two decisions, or perhaps other decisions that we haven't thought about, but at least two. So on the one hand, maybe the queen can cope with the bacteria on her own, uh, increase her immune system, but because energy is limited, you don't have energy to do everything well. So either you study for chemistry or you study for physics, but on the same day, studying for chemistry and physics for the same day of an exam is hard to do. So you have to make these decisions. So she can cope with bacteremia herself, and then that will have a cascading effect where uh, the contributions of her progeny may be less, or she can reproduce and invest as much as she can on those babies while perhaps not investing in her own immunity and therefore she could die faster. So those are the decisions that uh, these queens probably can do and this is what calls trade-offs and studying trade-offs is really cool stuff to do in ecological immunology. Now the decisions that this queen is making are really happening here in her ovaries. Okay, that's where the decisions are going on. So this is an ovary of a queen, a Sotromopsis queen, and you see the entire ovary and several of the ovarials, these little long chains of eggs. Uh, they start very small, the eggs up here, and as they start growing and getting and developing and getting bigger and bigger, they move down so you can see like little pearls getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until finally you end up there, okay? That's the egg. That's the egg that is about to be oviposited and it basically comes out through here. <coughs> now we know, um, we, so this is kind of an emulation of what I did, or what I, what Erin did, is she's injecting serratia into the hemocele when the female is developing these ovaries. So that's the bacteria there. And then that bacteria, because it's live, it's starting to reproduce on the hemocell of the insect. And what we know is that these eggs are permeable. They allow things to get in from the environment. Why? Because we know the serratia can get in there. And the reason why it can get there is because we get these funky eggs, okay? So serratia has, um, through transovarian infection, you see serratia getting into the eggs. So clearly, the egg, during the transition in the ovary, is getting things from mom, right? Now there's other important things that mom can give it. So there's uh, maternal uh, metabolites, such as lipids, vitellogenins, proteins, and other immune elicitors. And if the bacteria can get in, we can imagine that other things, other metabolites can also make it, right? So they can also go in there, the vitalogenins, immunolicitors, and so on. And so the, the idea is that maternal contributions could um, really influence the phenotype of those eggs. And so let me introduce you here to our big eggs. This is the recently oviposited uh, egg, 48 hours. You can see that these eggs always have these little bubbles inside. I hope you can see that from the back. Uh, all these little bubbles, these are vitalogenins. All these are maternally uh, contributed um, uh, lipoproteins that are the precursor, um, the egg yolk precursors. So it's all mom putting these uh, contributions into that uh, vitalogenin. Now, interestingly, vitalogenin is one of those molecules that does everything, does, does a lot of things. So it's not only a lipoprotein, but it's a also a protein or a, or a compound or a protein that basically um, works also in immunity. So vitalogenins are known to latch onto what's called PAMPs, and I had to write this because I keep on always forgetting what PAMPs really says. PAMPs means pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and that is LPS, lipopolysaccharides, peptidoglycans, all those little things that bacteria, for example, have on their outer membranes. And so vitalogenin comes in, latches onto the PAMPs, and make a complex. Remember, we talk about a complex in maternal, so I'm trying to make some kind of connection. You know, we as babies were creating this complex as well with maternal milk. Um, here's the same uh, thing here. And then these PAMPs get incorporated into the egg. 
So perhaps those lipopolysaccharides now make it into the egg, and then they themselves are immune eliciting the immune system of the embryo itself. It's a potential mechanism by which this is happening. Uh, vitalogenins are known to be antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral, okay? So this is a good uh, lipoprotein to have around, and mothers are shoving that into those eggs. So I've shown you that if you treat the mothers, the mothers have higher mortality with live bacteria, and we are expecting that there will be some, um, uh, some cascading effects uh, so that the progeny will be different. So now I'm gonna be going here into the progeny to show you some data on the maternal effects. Okay, so we're gonna take first embryo volume, and we took embryo volume because we thought that the, the size of these uh, eggs was a good proxy for measuring or uh, estimating uh, parental investment and resources allocations into the progeny. There's a lot of uh, good research out there showing that um, egg size correlates with the fitness of that progeny. So the bigger you are, the more resources you got, and the more resources you got, the better chances of you doing whatever you're gonna do. Either you develop faster, or you, once you develop and you're out there, you're actually um, better off, okay? So what we did, we, Erin did, is she took all these eggs, 600 and so eggs, almost 600, and she measured their, um, their length and their uh, width. Here you have that uh, stuff. And then she approximated this with uh, the cylinder of a formula of a cylinder to get the volume. Because remember that uh, it's not only surface area, there's actually volume on those eggs as well. And so this is the data. So now I'm starting to show you some data. Um, on, uh, this is the frequency of distributions uh, of egg volume here as a function of the maternal treatment. So la naive mothers, saline mothers, heat kill, and life. And what you can see here is that when you compare these across, uh, statistically, you compare these, you basically see that these distributions differ from one another. And when you look at the, what am I doing here? When you look at the median, so what I put here on top is the box plot that represents this here. So you can see where the median uh, is based on the data. This little line is the median. And what you can see here just by looking is that the median of the live serratia injected mothers, the eggs, uh, is smaller. So these eggs kind of look like maybe their volume is a little bit lower than everybody else. So at the first glance, embryo volume seems to exhibit phenotypic plasticity by looking at it just like the other smaller eggs. And they're smaller eggs because mothers got the live serratia uh, treatment. So embryo size seems to be compromised by maternal treatment. But remember that embryo size may be influenced not only by pathogens, <laughs> but by a lot of other stuff. So we really needed to control for other variables in the model. So we actually um, did a mixed effects uh, model analysis where we added all these different variables in the model. So the relatedness between the king and the queen, because the king and the queen could come from the same nest, so we call them siblings, sibling matings, kind of an inbred kind of a line versus outbred from different colonies. And so we needed to control for that in our setup. Uh, we also had the mother's colony of origin here, the maternal mass, if it's a big female and a heavy female versus a small female, and maternal treatment. And these are the results. Um, relatedness had nothing to do with uh, embryo volume. The, the colony where you're coming from as a mother seems to be very important in determining whether you're gonna have big eggs or small eggs. Uh, maternal mass, if you're a heavy female, that's a common um, uh, observation in insect biology. The bigger the, the female or the male, you know, you're gonna have bigger uh, progeny. And unfortunately, maternal treatment here had no effect. So all those differences that I show you in the frequency of distributions were probably driven by maternal origin and by maternal mass, but not by the treatment that we gave them. So we were kind of disappointed um, about that. So it seems that differences in embryo volume are not driven by uh, the maternal treatment, which again seems to suggest that maybe the size of an egg is very constrained, evolutionarily constrained, 
and you have to have an egg that seems to have be a certain size and it's refractory from treatment, maternal treatment. So then we say, okay, well, they're not changing in size, but maybe they're changing in their biochemistry, in their composition. So we try to go and figure out how much protein these eggs have, because maybe mothers are shoving in a lot of protein, right? And the size is not bigger, it's just a lot of more protein packed in the same size. So what we did is we ran a Bradford assay, I'm probably, you guys may have already run this, and ideally, this in yellow here are supposedly proteins. And ideally, we would like to run a Bradford assay on each of these eggs so that we have a big sample size. The problem with that is that we were constrained by the sensitivity of the Bradford assay. And so really, Erin had to play around so that whenever you ran this, you got the same result over and over. Repeatability was very important. And we decided that uh, pulling three eggs per sample was the minimum um, uh, that you needed in order for these to actually work out. So you get these uh, three eggs and you quantify, it's a colorimeter kind of an assay, you quantify how much protein is by changes in color of the little sample, and what we find is nothing. None of these variables actually explain the slight differences that we saw in protein content. So what this suggests to us, again, yeah, and even the interactions, nothing, nothing was significant, which was really depressing. Um, so we figured this is telling us that volume is not changing as a function of maternal treatment, and that total protein is not variable. Everyone gets the same amount of protein, okay? So we were not happy with that. But then we thought, okay, you know, this is one of those things that you keep on getting hit in the by the hammer on the head and say, it's not going well, it's not going well. So we figured, okay, let's go and actually look at different types of protein, right? Because total protein is total protein, mm -hmm. but there may be different types of protein, protein. So we have structural proteins, hormones, contractile, storage, immune proteins versus <coughs> other stuff. So maybe what mothers are doing is they have two choices. They have total protein for the viability of the progeny but then in the face of disease, maybe mothers are adding immune proteins in those eggs, okay? And maybe what they're doing is they're reducing total protein, but they're increasing immune protein. And that's why we see no differences in the total protein, because protein is protein, and we were just measuring total. But if you look at the quality of what types of colon, maybe we would find something like that. So the only way we could really come up with testing whether this was immune protein versus everything else is by running an antibacterial assay. And what we were thinking is you put eggs and if they have more, anti, uh, um, if they have more immune protein, then eggs that have more immune protein are gonna suppress the growth of bacteria in an assay that, like this. So let me introduce you quickly to Arthrobacter um, uh, bacteria. This is also a gram negative, just like serratia. We should have used serratia here because we treated mothers with serratia and that should make sense. But we didn't use serratia because serratia is a very sturdy bacterium. It's very hard to kill it, even when you are taking antibiotics yourself. So you have an egg, chances are is that we're not gonna see anything if we use serratia. So we wanted to do, uh, use Arthrobacter because even though it's a gram-negative bacteria similar to serratia, this is a very susceptible bacterium. So we wanted to push the envelope on our favor and say, if there's anything, let's use something that's really susceptible to see if there's anything. All right, so that's why we use Arthrobacter. Oh. And just quickly before uh, um, uh, I go there, so you can use this assay put in here uh, medium with the Arthrobacter by itself, right? That's our control. Um, and usually bacteria grow this way, okay? So you stay a little while here, incubating, incubating, and then suddenly these bacteria start reproducing. So you get this very sharp increase, um, the exponential curve, the exponential line of growth. Then it gets stationary. Then you have a lot of bacteria here already, and they start eating up all the nutrients in your agar, and so it starts going down. All right, so what we did is we take this slope as the measure for rates of reproduction of this, um, or, or rates of, of growth of the bacteria. In the other wells, we added three eggs, 
with their total protein and perhaps hopefully their immune protein as well, we sonicated, we basically made scrambled eggs, we pop them open and we use the contents and then we use that to add onto the Arthrobacter as well, to let Arthrobacter grow in the presence of uh, three eggs contents, okay? And so if the proteins are very heavy here, the red ones, which are immune proteins, you would expect Arthrobacter to be lower. And so this is the result for the maternal treatment. So what you see here again is our controls are here. So this is Arthrobacter by itself, no eggs. And then you have here eggs of mothers that were treated to with naive, saline, heat kill, and life. And here's the slope of that line that I showed you. The first thing you can see is that um, eggs appear to be antimicrobial, right? Because wherever you have eggs here, okay, the median growth of that Arthrobacter was significantly lower than the control itself. So this is the first time we're showing that eggs, as immature as they are, right, seem to already have some antimicrobial properties. And maybe that is because the vitalogenins are antibacterial <coughs> and you're full with antibacterial vitalogenins and that's perhaps the reason why. All right, so we see that the termite embryos have antibacterial properties. If you get rid of that control, what we see is that there's really no significant difference in antimicrobial activity as a function of treatment, of maternal treatment. Yet again, another one of those that you go, my God, it did not work, <laughs> all right? So the antibacterial properties are not influenced by the queen treatment. We were expecting that and it didn't just pan out, all right? But it's still nice to see that eggs have antibacterial activity. I'm just gonna show you the paternal effects just to show you that exactly the same result. So when females were naive and fathers, the kings were treated, this is that, okay? And so you can see a, almost a mirroring of, of the same pattern. So again, very significant against the controls, but when you get rid of the controls and you only compare those uh, treatments, um, the eggs of naive females paired with males that were treated differently um, were also not more antibacterial. So that was a bummer, all right? And so while we were working on all of these, we, her, was working on all of these, we were also preparing eggs to send to Graham Thompson, our collaborator in Canada, because he's a molecular guy and we know nothing about molecular uh, techniques. So um, what we thought is that perhaps the embryonic gene expression could be influenced by immune elicitors. Remember that the vitalogenin is pushed in with um, perhaps immune elicitors, maternal transcripts here. Uh, the mother produces the transcripts and then she shoves those transcripts into the egg. Perhaps the mother is methylating the DNA of that progeny somehow or by micro uh, RNAs. We, we don't know. Now this is a very complex um, immune um, diagram uh, of insects. Just to tell you that um, insects have different cascades, immune cascades. So you have, I'm sure you have heard about the tall uh, pathway, uh, Jackstad as well, this one here. The one we focus is called the IMD pathway, which is this one here, because IMD pathway is elicited when you perceive, you, when the termite or the insect perceives gram negative. So we should be looking there because we use gram negative. Uh, here, for example, uh, the toll is basically induced when the insects look uh, or perceive a fungus, okay? So each of these is recept receiving or recept being a receptor for uh, different types of, uh, of uh, um, pumps. Remember that, pumps? Uh, and, uh, and so in this case, we're using IMD pathway. Now, in the IMD pathway, you actually have two genes. And so we have the IMD gene, which is this little yellow business here, all right? You also have relish, which is here, downstream, okay? So we took these two genes that are in the IMD pathway and we basically ran the transcriptomics on that, okay? So again, I don't really know much about this because this is, to me, is magic. I just send these eggs to him and he tells me what's coming out. But the whole thing is that he used these primers so again, you have relish and IMD. This is the primer sequence. 
And these, again, are genes that are involved in the cascade that produce long-lived antimicrobial peptides. We know that, okay? We also, or he also used this other one, which is an internal endogenous um, gene that he used as a reference. So that's, you have to always run a reference where you know that this gene is there, but it doesn't change as a function of treatment of the mother. And so you use that to standardize these other genes that do change. That's as much as I understand of this business, okay? And so let me show you the results. So now we're really happy because what you have here is fold expression differences as a function of, and in this case, we dropped the heat heal treatment because it was very expensive to run and we had no money. So we did a naive um, eggs from naive mothers, eggs from saline mothers, and eggs from live serration mothers. The heat kill were dropped. And what you can see here, these are eggs, okay? So again, they were pulled, what, three or four eggs? Four, four eggs. So he, for here, you needed to pull four eggs to get one sample. So you lose, you know, eggs really quickly when you start pulling them in order to run all these. But surprisingly to us, based on all the stuff that we had run that nothing seemed to be working, there was a significant upregulation of relish, okay? Um, almost 2.5 times uh, more regulation when you were the egg of a life infected mother. So that's pretty cool. We were like jumping all over. The IMD uh, shows a very similar pattern, okay? But this was not significant. So the difference between here and here was actually not significantly different. All right, so there seems to be a trend towards upregulation, but it was not a significant um, thing. So the question is then, is there molecular evidence for TGIP? And the answer is transcriptomically molecular, yes, there is, okay? Relish increases here. But there's a problem with this, okay? And by the way, we don't know whether these relish transcripts that are here in this egg came from the embryo itself producing higher re uh, re relish, or whether the mothers were shoving in transcripts for relish, uh, or there was some other methylation, we don't know the mechanism, but we were able to figure out that eggs from live injected mothers do have higher relish transcripts. All right, but there's a problem. If I'm finding higher relish here, why then did I not see higher antibacterial activity, right? If the eggs are responding by increasing the transcripts of relish, why don't I see antibacterial effects? And the only reason that I can come up with that is that perhaps these eggs are too young. And so what we have is we have transcripts, but not translation yet, okay? So we have, the transcripts are there, but translation has not happened into an effector molecule that actually can kill our bacteria. I'm hoping that's the reason. I, otherwise, I don't really know how to explain this, okay? So, uh, currently what we're doing, we, again, Erin, has in, um, in, in the freezer at the university, she has um, organisms, uh, larva. So now we're not doing 48 hours babies. We're waiting for those babies to hatch so that hopefully now transcription and translation are happening and we can now go back and see the antimicrobial activity of those first instar larva where both transcription and translation happen. And we expect that eggs from mothers who were injected with live bacteria should show us now higher antibacterial properties. I'm hoping, we'll see. So just to finish with this, uh, um, uh, we don't think that uh, mothers are providing antimicrobial, functional antimicrobial peptides to the offspring. Otherwise, we would have seen higher antibacterial properties on the eggs, and we don't see that. Um, perhaps mothers are giving immune elicitors, but if translation is not happening at 48 hours, we don't have a way to really know that, okay? Um, we do have some evidence that mothers are influencing the gene expression of the embryos. Relish seems to be increasing, uh, but here is only transcription uh, evidence, not translation evidence, and so that's why we're going here uh, to this first instar larva and trying to test antibacterial activity again. So this is the take home message. I'm gonna try to go a little faster because I do wanna talk about the males. So queens suffer higher mortality when experiencing uh, serration, we knew that. Embryonic volume and total protein do not seem to be affected by 
uh, maternal treatment. So there might be some developmental constraints with respect to that. Embryos, regardless of maternal treatment, seem to have antibacterial properties. So that's a good one for us to be able to say something worked. Uh, upregulation of um, two immune genes. Relish was significant. IMD tended towards increased, but it's not really significant. The antibacterial properties were not influenced by maternal treatment, but we think that that's because we were picking a stage that was way too early. You know, an egg that was sitting only in the, in the petri dish for 48 hours, it has transcripts, but doesn't have um, the, the effector molecule in it. Questions? <laughs> so let me just show you quickly what we've done with the males, because the males deserve some attention too. And so up till now we've talked about the females, but what about the males? And again, I wanna stress that this is very, very preliminary data, and I'm trying very hard to be excited about this, and, and, uh, and hopefully this will pan out. Uh, we know that males are important and they're providing something to the female. We saw that yesterday in her, um, in Erin's um, presentation. And you've seen this in the same way uh, as before. Now we have the kings. And the kings have two choices. If you treat them with bacteria, perhaps uh, they will invest in dealing with the bacteria at the expense of investing in reproductive tissue, right? You don't have enough energy to do that. So the energy goes to immunity, then maybe you have little testes. On the other hand, you can actually reproduce and have big testes and then die because you did not really took the time and effort and energy to create an immune response. So again, the same idea as the queens. So um, we're just starting to really understand and learn and optimize the technique. So I'm not showing you really lots of data, just talking to you about what I have learned in the last uh, eight months of doing this. So we treated again the males, the same way as the females with the same thing. And this is the setup. We set up more than 200 <coughs> incipient colonies Male, females, those are the females up there, naive, because now we're interested in the male, not in the female, and the male got this. Out of these 200, we could only use 92 colonies, okay? And the reason why is because we were very strict in what we were choosing to move forward. And so we only use colonies in which the king and the queen were alive at day 30, post-treatment or post-pairing, and the female had at l oviposited at least one egg. If you did not have and meet these two criteria, you, we were not using you, okay? And the reason is, number one, we want both male and female because the social interactions between male and female are known to be important in the development of the gonads. So females in the presence of a male will have bigger gonads and the vice versa as well for the males. And because if you have an egg, that is a, a clue and tells me um, that uh, the male is copulated with a female and that the male probably has functional testes. That's what we decided that that was the criteria we were gonna use. If you survive with a female and you had eggs, then we took the males, sacrificed the males, and then we get the testes. And all of this is still in progress and we're just optimizing these kinds of uh, research. But what have we learned till now? I knew nothing about testes, nothing. I had no idea what they look like, where they were, and the front, in the back, nothing. So we started by looking at uh, these two publications and where I could see what do testes look like. So these here, these little balls here, are the testes for different termite species. Uh, this is my cool down decapitated male. Uh, and what we do is, um, we cut with scissors on the side, we cut on scissors on the side, we take this and we fold it up. And when you fold that up, what you see is the gut. The gut is huge, the gut is there, and the gut is basically taking all the space. So you go in and you're like, huh, what are the, where are these testes? And you see nothing. So it takes a little finesse to finally understand that you need to look for something that looks so like this. This is the testes. So what you have to learn to do is take the gut and fold it towards the left, upwards, and then these little things <coughs> appear somewhere there. Okay, so these are testes. Um, this is the accessory gland here and here. Now what I have learned is that the testes, amazingly enough, are super sturdy. You can go in and pick them up with the hardest 
forceps ever, and they will not break. The accessory gland is a different story. Sometimes you pull the testes, and it comes nicely with the accessory gland. Most of the times you pull the testes, and there's no accessory gland. So in order for me to be consistent, uh, I always use non-accessory gland testes. So that I had to remove the accessory gland. Okay, and so that's what we had. This is a t kind of a photo of the testes. And we then used image A uh, to try to figure out the surface area. Interestingly, what I realized is that some of these males are producing asymmetrical testes. I assumed that if the left is big, the right should be big. Apparently, that's not the case. So what this shows me is these are the left and right of the same male, and what this shows me is if I want to get a real measure, I have to collect both testes. I cannot just use the first one I found, which is a bummer because as you're dissecting and you have all your males there ready, then you go like that, and between transferring from here to there, the testes fell down, you can't use the male. And then, the, and then all these issues, that's reducing sample size quite dramatically. So anything that we do now, we have to do with the two testes. So this is a droplet of this uh, burns Tracy saline we use. Um, you can see the two testes here nicely as well. We have to use both because we need to overall um, male um, uh, investment in testes size. Okay, and now we have these uh, uh, testes, we can m m run protein quantification, protein profiles in an SDS page gel to see the protein profiles and also test the antimicrobial activity of these testes. Um, so that reduces sample size quite a bit. If anyone here works with testes or sperm, please let me know, I need help. Because I would like to actually get a sperm count and see if pathogenic exposure uh, influences sperm count. And this is a squashed testes, and then I stained it, and that's as much as I know. I cannot, I, I looked around for testes and sperm in termites. What I have found is that they're supposed to be round, and I don't know if this is or not. These, I don't know if these are te uh, sperm cells. We see these long little things here all over the place, a lot of them. I don't know if those are, so if you know, let me know. I need to talk to you, okay? This is data, uh, the, uh, the only data I have for you today is thanks to Jeraila, who did an oh, amazing student, and she's here presenting her, her um, um, test is there. And she did the image A, so you get that, you get the surface area, and uh, this is the only graph I have for this. Total surface area in pixels um, as a function of the two testes. My expectation, again, was that if you are the testes of naive males, you should have nice big testes. If you were saline injected just by the cuticle puncturing, maybe your testes, and a little bit of energy was shunted into repair and healing, and so maybe your testes start suffering just a little bit. If you're heat killed, uh, mm -hmm. maybe you're here, but I clearly thought that if you receive live bacteria, you should have really tiny testes, okay? That's what I thought. <coughs> this is what we get. Nothing, okay? <laughs> so again, testis size is constrained, at least for maternal treatment. We are now understanding that clearly there's other things we need to look and other factors. Uh, factors, it seems, it seems to me that if this is real and we believe this, maybe males are actually doing that. No matter what, no matter what the pathogen is or not, they're still investing as much as uh, the other ones. So I'm not sure yet, and again, this is an ongoing study. But this is also to show you, we need to think about colony of origin of the males. These are different colonies from where the males came as a function of surface area of the testes. And you can already see that colony of origin needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, also the mass of the king may be important. So we cannot just run maternal treatment without controlling for the effects of all these other things. And we're in the process of analyzing and obviously collecting way many more testes, but that's basically the, the idea that we're doing now. So I'm gonna go fast because um, that's a protein wrath word. I just wanna clearly thank all of you for being here and listening. Um, and NSF and, and the East Bay Regional Park District who has supported my peak collecting termites there for more than 
35 years, so they're awesome. Uh, this is money that came from Canada for the transcriptomics. And, uh, and all of you, thank you. So, thank you, Rebecca, no for the amazing talk. Well, uh, I just have some posters as I'm holding the microphone, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's really wonderful uh, work and uh, study. Uh, the eggs are really, uh, are, are really uh, it's really nice that you look at the eggs, but I'm looking forward to hear what you got from the larvae. Because the eggs are always groomed I am too by the looking forward to see them. The, <laughs> the, the eggs are always groomed by the workers, Saliba, so they have like little things, so that the uh, but the larvae a little less. And also the tests, so you should talk yeah. to Ana Maria. The, the, the paper that I told you that yes. we got, it's exactly on cop the thermos gets right. Perfect. So yeah. I'll just so print, print, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. a print for that's you. Really <laughs> uh, that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Listen, there's nothing out there. It's really very, so if you have something, I need to learn from you. Because I'm stuck with this. Ah, yeah, yeah, there, there's two. Yeah. The, just coming this year, so that's really nice. So, we are timed up, but we, we do have time for questions, and uh, uh, yeah, there's no problem. I'll be around later, we can jump Please in. just hand uh, up your hand and use the microphone, because the, we are filming, so to make the questions, okay? So, questions? <laughs> you did. Yeah, I have a question. Well, I have several questions, but we can talk about some of them all later. Um, you had this graph with the embryo volume, and the naive ones, it looks like B5 over the distribution. Um, is this, could this be that it's male and female, or why do you get the bimodal distribution? I think the bimodal distribution for those naives, uh, it may be just a, a, a result of you know, where the colony, the mother, maternal colony was. So maybe that setup of colonies was made up of mothers who usually produce large eggs and also queens that are coming from a different colony that produce lower. So colony of origin and mass of the female was were significant in influencing um, the volume. So that by modality may be explained by, by the number of, um, by, by the colony of origin. When you, when you actually look at the individual females, they're not bimodal at all. It's only when you look at the population that it looks that way. Thank you. We can say that if the soil is contaminated with these bacteria, both of the pounding parents should be exposed at the same time. Yep. Did you try both? Yes. So, so we have. have so Erin uh, has maternal effects. So we're only mm -hmm. colonies where only queens were um, uh, treated. Fathers were treated only, and then both were treated or none were treated. Mm -hmm. And so we have all the permutations. And do you want to say something about? Sure. So in terms of transgenerational new priming, uh, because of it, it takes. A month to get eggs, uh, but because the transcript comics was expensive, we only sent Graham the maternal effects, so we only have the volume data and the protein data. And like the queens, they didn't differ. Um, for the larval experiment, that's actually those larvae came from what I presented yesterday, where you wait 80 days to collect larvae, and to do that, it just wasn't feasible to do both the males and females at the same time because to get larvae for the queens I just set up with 300 colonies and one, one person. <laughs> but I would really like to do that because I do think, I, I think the kings must be contributing as well. Yeah, uh, we do have the antimicrobial graph of combined effects. So when you have male and female treated and look at the antimicrobial, and it's very similar to the maternal and the paternal. So even when you're combining, there's a little more of variance, if I remember correctly. I didn't put the graph there. There's more variance, but it's not significant. Again, eggs are 
antibiotic, they have antibiotic properties, but not as a function of maternal, paternal, or combined effects. And other, uh, another observation that I think that will be very helpful to see, as you mentioned, the methylation of these stones, mm -hmm. mono B3 methylation, that is a mechanism that allows uh, before your stress, you, like your parents open the door of the fridge and say, you still have all these uh, genes to be used, mm -hmm. you know? So when a cell is stressed by, uh, for example, in cancer, like there are all, all this methylation closes or contracts the DNA, not uh, making the accessory proteins allowed and available, mm -hmm. and making other sectors of the DNA <coughs> more available for transcription. transcription. So I think that methylation studies on histones will be very Yeah, so that's, that's the idea. And again, unfortunately for that, we are relying on Canada to do the, yes. the, uh, the pendulum and, uh, and the epigenetic part of it. Yeah. But yeah, we're excited about it. I'm surprised that from all the things we measured, the one that seems to work is the transcriptomic because I've got nothing to do with what I do. Okay. Thank you.